manufacturing, technology, hot topics, and a little bit of tomfoolery. This is the MTD Podcast. So welcome to today's MTD Podcast. This is episode tw- number 23. I can't believe how fast we're rolling through these. Um, today we're going to be talking about vertical turning and vertical boring machines. I'm joined by Gio and Joe this morning. How are you doing, gentlemen? Beautiful sunny day out there. It's good, isn't it? Uh, See, so you've come dressed down, Joe. You've chosen um, different Dr- colours today. Dressed down on Friday. Yes, I know it's Thursday. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> and at the weekend, Gio, what are you up to? Anything good? Taking the family out yeah. for a day, Paul. So that'd be nice. Yeah, so Anywhere nice? The weather's, uh, we're, uh, we're not sure yet. We're going to try and meet up with my brother and his wife. And I've got to take the kids football first. They've just started football on a Saturday. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Who, who are they playing to? for? Um, Chetwin Cubs is the, the the name of the team. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, Chetwin Cubs. The well, it's only Nico, but Oscar comes with me as well. <laughs> How American's that? Cubs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let, let's talk about this um, this topic, vertical turning. We, we do you not want to do? No, well, I'm doing the weekend. No, not really. No, no, I, I don't think it's airable. Is it? Is it airable? <laughs> can, Carry on. Can you tell people? VTLs <laughs> barbecue. You'll, you'll, you'll be looking at VPLs. Won't you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, VTLs and uh, vertical boring. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing about this topic, I wanted to, um, and I spent a lot of time researching and trying to find out, um, you know, the differences between the machines and some of the features and benefits. And we've done a lot of videos on these in the past. But to start with, a um, bit of a challenge to you guys. What is the difference between a VTL and a, and a, a vertical boring machine, a VBM? Uh, both look at each other. Uh, yeah, well, predominantly it's the turret, isn't it? So the, the 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 VTL stands for turret. The VBL stands for boring. Where did you Where did you get that from? From you earlier, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, Does it? Because I thought it's turning. Is it not vertical turning lathe then? No, no, no. The, well, this is what I thought. There, you can, you uh, a VTL could be vertical turning lathe, but if you if you research it and look, a VTL is a vertical turret lathe. And and I always called it a vertical turning lathe. And, and, and to be nice. fair, you can see that I did do more research. It, it is, is yeah, turret, yeah. yeah, yeah it, it's see. vertical turret lathe. There we are. And when you look, when you look. Um, at a vertical turret lathe, it, it makes perfect sense, mm. doesn't it? But you don't often see them. You don't see them new now, do you? Because you've got the the turret up there. It's a bit like a horizontal lathe with mm. the turret above it, indexing round with six or eight and, tools. And it's on. quite interesting when you're walking around doing your tours. You straight away, you look at it and you know it's a vertical bore or a vertical lathe, don't you? Straight away, but. If someone said, what's the difference, like we're doing now, it's quite challenging to come up with reasons, isn't it? Yeah, Even though visually, you know straight away what it is. But, but you know, so, so boring is the, the uh, inside diameter and turning is the OD. Mm. That really, they are the only differences. But when you start getting to more sophisticated vertical uh, turning centres, that's when you start associating the, the, the more axes with them, don't you? You wouldn't, mm. you wouldn't look at some of the machines that we, we, we do videos on and call them vertical boring machines, would you? Because that would almost be a mistake, I feel. You can do both, can't you now? Mm. Yeah, it, but exactly it's boring that. and turning. Yeah, and how popular are they? How many, do you, how many do you see around on your travels in machine shops? Well, for me, it, it, it seems to be, a few years ago, it was a big influx. We see lots of inquiries through the website, you see lots of installations where I, I would say it's not as good as it was. You know, I'm not, I'm not being negative, but I don't see as many in new installations as I did five, six years ago. Um, why is that? I'm not sure. But, is it a bit like the horizontal machining centre, the topic we, we touch on, that really they're under they're undersold, you know, they're underutilised? Yeah. I, 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 don't I say dis- application. I disagree with that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, I think it is down to what kind of industry you're going into, what kind of parts that you're looking to, to, to manufacture. Um, you know, the, the, the weight and the size of the component are absolutely critical. But the, the reason for that is because of the weight. So if you were putting a part on a horizontal, you've got inertia that comes into play. How far are you sticking the part out of the chuck? How big do, do you need to, you know, you, you, you wouldn't be able to take cut the part with the same forces because of the inertia, because of the weight that you're putting onto the horizontal, because you're fighting against gravity. When you're putting a component onto a, a, a vertical lathe, the casting of the lathe gives the rigidity and that you can put as much weight on it as you want, if you like. And then because the turret and the tools and the ra- or the ram or whatever the case may be is coming down onto the part, all the forces are downward and it's taking them forces. But when you come in, in an horizontal plane, obviously, again, you haven't got the same ma- amount of forces. A- absolutely. And, and obviously, t- typically, we were talking VTLs. First thing that comes into my head is large components, you know, half a metre plus. Is, is what yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. But you can look at some EMAG style machines and they can be doing little parts for engines that may be two inches in diameter. 
So it isn't just large, you know. Abs- it, absolutely not. Yeah. It isn't just large components, even though it's probably fair to say the majority of machines are sold for, for the reasons Joe's made. The, the but size is it of an under-education? The the component. Is it the fact that the, the market's not educated? Are you looking? Are you, are you finding people using a horizontal lathe and thinking actually you might you might be better off doing that? On, I, I, on a I, vertical think, I, I think yeah, absolutely. I think some people are knife and forking it on an horizontal lathe where maybe the right machine is a, a vertical. And the reason being as well is it lends itself to more up applications when you've got a vertical lathe. And the reason for that is is your work holding options change because on a horizontal lathe your work holding options are limited so but if you look at it on a vertical lathe you could start to do uh, irregular shaped parts intermittent cutting and um, you could have for example magnetic work holding on there surely if it's the just parts a chuck are, though isn't it surely it's just a chuck you can have face plate you can have face plates you can offset them you can you, can't you do that on a horizontal lathe you, you can to a certain degree but you imagine putting uh, a magnetic chuck on a horizontal lathe again and a heavy part, gravity's fighting against you, you know. You, you, so, but again, when, when you're on the vertical, gravity is, is it working in your favour? So that's the, that's the big difference. That's the big key element, um, so, in my opinion. So what is a downside to a, verti- well, uh, lathe with a vertical configuration? This, this, is just, this is just me looking at it logically. If you've got... One of the things about a vertical lathe is people look at them and go... The size of the machine, the footprint of the machine, me is advantageous because I can get maybe two, three, four machines in the same foot. Let's let's take a depending let's take on a the fi- height of your factory. Co- correct. <laughs> let, let, let's take it. Let's take a. Let's say you're doing a 15 inch billet. Okay, you can put that on a vertical lathe, and the footprint of the machine will be much smaller than if you try and put that on a horizontal lathe. Under okay. half, probably. Yeah. So you can get two machines in the space of one. But I, I, I would then question. It's a bit like when you've got the vertical lathe. I know you talk about gravity down, but is that as stable? It's a bit like um, you know, let's say a fridge. If you've got a fridge that's up, it's quite easy to do that with. If you lay it on its side in the horizontal plane, it's, it's it. You feel that because there's much more weight towards the ground that it's a bit more you, yeah but you try, you try picking up the fridge from one end but it's you, going you, to topple but, over but you've it? got you're, you're holding that fridge on minimal material and then the, the length of it, it you've got the I'm inertia about the, I'm, not, I'm not talking as the fridge being a part I'm talking as the fridge being the machine you you imagine it uh, just uh, yeah just I don't I know what saying. I don't think the, I don't think of VTL it's a bit like you if you're standing you know can I push you over when you're standing up or is it easier to push you around when you're laying down? Yeah, but the argument's not the machine, is it? The argument is the component within the machine. I, I, it, I, I, I think the casting's going to be solid enough in that configuration, obviously, because you, your casting is going to be a, a greater surface area than your actual swing diameter at the top. So it's going to be 100% stable. There's not going to be any kind of rigidity issues in any way, shape or form. What, what about What about measurement? What about getting into the machine to um, to inspect the part? Is that going to be more difficult on horizontal well, it, or on it, a vertical lathe than it is it, on a horizontal? Maybe again, we're talking about it depends on the component and the size of the, the machine and things. But typi- changing tools, yeah, so, you know, typically I would say they're less operator friendly than a horizontal. I know it's a bit, you know, again, horses for courses. But some of these VTLs, even quite small machines, you've actually got to stand up, or you've got to actually make some framing to climb up. You've got to get in the machine, especially if you're short. Exactly. Yeah, yeah GM. Short people. With, uh, with cranes and things. I think it's fair to say, horizontal, unless you're going really big, horizontal layers are probably a little more user friendly. Having said that, you know, just looking at the January issue of the MTD magazine here, and I went to uh, Forge Masters in Sheffield, and quite obviously, that is the only way of doing what they do. You, you can't be putting that in a horizontal lathe. You know, it's, it's huge. The, the swarf remove, the swarf uh, fall away is a big one as well, isn't it? How many times do you see on a horizontal lathe people? you know, swarf becoming an issue. You just don't have that. You, you um, say that. If you're doing a bore, I know you, you can pull it on a bolster, swarf is going to get stuck at the is, bottom, yeah, isn't it? If you're yeah. taking off enough material, you've, you've, got, you've got a bigger problem, in fact. Because you've... How, you, how, how do you it's get not, it out? It's staying in the bore, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it's so how, on earth, how on earth do you get down? On the, on the vertical, on the horizontal lathe, you can get, you could, it could get, yeah, make some sort of contraption, yeah. get your arm in there, probably not a good idea, but you know, get the swarf out on the VTR, you've, you've kind of had it, really. I know they do bolster them up so the swarf, they can get underneath and things, but you know... I suppose it, if the spindle was inverted, it's different, isn't it, to if it sure. was up in, in that yeah, plane? Yeah, yeah, sure. Like if, you, if you look at... Uh, yeah, exactly. If you look at an EMAG machine again, where the component is upside down, they are the perfect machine in conditions but I might be wrong but I don't suppose EMAG will sell you a machine with a you know with a, to make a four meter component would they you know it's I think as well the accessibility of getting so say for example 
yeah, you, you've got a massive part. And and going to your story at, at Forge Masters, you try and get that onto into a vertical lathe or a horizontal lathe. You know, with with the the vertical laves, actually getting you know lifting parts on into the machine is a lot easier than trying to put them and load them in from an horizontal plane. That's a big big factor and a big consideration the other thing with the, with the with the vertical turning center is the the you know the difference between the w axis and the z axis yeah it's good yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah it's a good function so so the w axis is is kind of bringing the, the ram closer so you've got much you've got you've got less air between the part and um the you know where where the ram would be that gives you much more stability as well so you can move that w axis right down to the top of the part reduce the length of the ram in order to get maximum stiffness when you're machining. Uh, just on the W axis, what what is that? You would only use that when you're going inside a component, because because you could because you don't actually need to use it. Do you? If you're if you're dropping down to the component, it depends how tall the part is. Of course, if the if the parts. Oh, so you're saying yeah? So you incre increasing your stroke. A, a great yeah, yeah, yeah. a great application for the W axis is for the Cogsteel ZX range. So effectively, then you can be doing more applications with your actual machine tool. So with the you, you can. Oh, that, that, I'm sorry, I just dropped my water there. But with the with, with the W axis and the ZX range, you're actually giving the, your machine tool another axis um, with how it works because it's pushing out the tool and coming out uh, in, in a different uh, different like axis, a ninety so, degree head. Yeah, so it, it is very very good feature to have. Have you seen the ones with the two rams? That's really interesting. I saw one once where you got you got a, two oh, yeah, rams, yeah, yeah. so you can do. Uh, roughing and semi finishing at the same time, it's almost like balance turning. Yeah, on balance like, turning. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the same time as well, you imagine a lot of these. Like when when um, when I was uh, operating a vertical, I'd call it a vertical boring machine, really. Uh, um, just after my apprenticeship, we did flywheels for diesel engines. So, um, in fact, I remember the cycle time. It was twenty two hours to turn this OD, do the bore, and then this, and then it used to come off. I used to turn it over, and then I used to do the the, the second operation on the on the um, on the top face and then it used to go off to a drilling machine and did, then you, did you time it so you had to like do it on the no, other shift no, the thing the <laughs> thing was i look at that now that flywheel now and there was there was holes drilled right around the outside on the periphery and on, on the top face and on the bottom face i look at it now and think how much faster you could do it and i honestly reckon that you could probably get the whole thing down to five six hours with one of these machines by doing things like having the two rams uh you know roughing finishing drilling because when imagine if you're drilling on the od um, and you've got two drilling heads. You're doing two holes yeah. as it's as it's turning around at once. Can you put the angle heads in the rams configure in in that yeah. configuration? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. Can do keyways, I, anything. Yeah. Well, we're, we're on, a, on a ram configuration. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, so I reckon I could have got that down to five hours, and I could probably have improved the twenty-two when I was there as well if I'd have turned the feed rate up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want to do that just, on a night just, shift. Just on VTLs, we talk a lot about boxways or linear. Obviously, when we get into a, some of the size of machines we're talking about, presumably we're going box, we're going really heavy duty. How about if I've got like, I um, mean, you, you see a lot of Doosan, Mazax, Leadwell machines, probably 12, 14, 16 inch diameter, much smaller machines. Where, where's the pros and cons lies between box and linear on those? I think I, th I, I think that's just comparable to um, a horizontal machine, isn't it? You know, it's down to... You know, coin Geo's phrase, it depends on what you're doing. Um, the bigger the machine... Even though the weight's on the, the, the bed, the, you know, it's down, it's the, solid, the, it's more... Yeah, I mean, you know, there's always the argument that linear rails are much better these days. They're faster. You take, le you know, less deeper cuts, but more of them. Um, so I, th I don't think that argument changes between machine tool and machine tool. One of the things that I picked up on actually from... Um, watching a video, and it was actually an MTD video that um, I remember doing, is the hydrostatic um, boxways. I don't know if you know how they operate. Well, they're basically like metal on metal with a very thin film of oil between them. That's, what, apparently that's what that, that boss is, installation. Is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently that is the, the, the ultimate in, in, in rigidity that you can get on a machine. Now, you wouldn't do that on a 10-inch you know, <laughs> chuck vertical lathe. You just wouldn't need it. So there's an argument to say that actually the, the linear rail configuration would be fine for that. So I, I think it does depend it's on It's incredible. That. When you look at that boss machine, you know, I can't, I can't remember the, the weight of the machine, but thousands of tons and, that, and that's, hydrostatic, and that's how, running I mean, on how, oil it's incredible yeah how, how does that it doesn't logically compute with me i can understand how um you know a linear rail works and all of the, uh, but but when i look at a hydrostatic box guy where i'm thinking of two faces of metal moving um 
on top, one on top of the other with a thin That's layer. correct, yeah. Yeah, so... But, but, but it, I think, it's, I think it's, it's, is there's it not, science in it, it's seems... It's a bit like hydraulic and pneumatic, though, isn't it? If you put water in a cylinder and you try and push that water, it may as well be concrete, it's not going anywhere. And I think it's a similar thing with hydrostatic. Uh, well, I think if a good analogy is, is, is say if you, yeah. you make two mating parts with the absolutely... Fan, the best surface finish you possibly can, you put them on top of each other and they're just slight... You, you just tap it and it would just slide so smoothly yeah, does, yeah. and that is that kind of uh, technology i believe because the, the, it's such a to a good surface finish accuracy and then all, ultimately then you're passing that accuracy on to the parts that you're actually making Being more wear doing that or less wear well that's so. probably the film where the film comes in i would imagine but i think that because it's so accurate so uh, the so it, it, i don't know paul it's a good growth you know uh, heat again well, that's it's a good it's a, it's a good yeah it's it's a good question but i mean going going to to kind of accuracy the boring application is down to roundness. You know, you're doing it on a, a vertical lathe because of you need perfect roundness, perfect surface finish, and, and you know, especially when you're boring. Um, you know, th this can't be achieved yet by circular interpolation on a on a milling machine mm -hmm. because, albeit circular interpolation has come a long way, when you go and put inspect it, it's not perfectly round. And the only way of getting something perfectly round is by turning or boring still. What, what about the tooling? This is also a, um, when you start getting into the multifunction machines, you can, you can use BT50 tools. You can uh, you know, have your standard turning tool holders. There's also a system that I looked at recently on the Honosiki machine, which they call the double lock system or the side lock system, which actually gives you something like 10 tonnes of clamping I can remember force. that video. That I can't did. remember yeah, yeah. the detail. There is a, a video on our YouTube channel on it, how it achieves it. But they reckon that that's five times the clamping force of most VTLs, which means you can you can almost double the depth of cut because you don't get any spring or, you know. Um, so the, got the, tool, the, the tooling's a big part too, isn't tooling it? Tooling and work holding. Go, going back to your, uh, your Rolls-Royce days, and you, you say turn on one machine, drill on, drill on another. There's a good quote in here in this, uh, this January magazine. The inherent risks when moving parts from one machine to another include the risk of setup and time taken to reset each part for the manufacturing operation. And I think that's exactly it, isn't it? You put the part on once, whether it's a sliding head or vertical uh, lathe in a vertical configuration, you just want it off in a timely manner, less operations, well, certainly less machine tools. Some of these components will take all day to move. Yeah. Well, well, well. You, 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 it's a good point because when I used to have to turn that flywheel over, the craning operation in itself, I used to wait for the crane. So if the crane was being used somewhere up the machine shop, I had to wait for it. Once I'd got it, I had to turn it over. Then I had to stick it. Then lunch. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then I had to stick. Then I had to stick it on the machine, clock it. You know, clock yeah. this huge flywheel up. That could take then an dinner. hour. Then dinner. Well, I. I, I <laughs> It's funny you say that. I worked on a, a, a few projects on vertical laves where to, to make Rolls Royce engine rings um, on a Mazat Mega Turn, actually, Joe. But we were, we were looking at applications, and I know they did it. And there was a big uh, engine ring manufacturer up north. I won't mention the name. They still use um, an old traditional method of setting their engine rings up, like on face plates. So effectively, they'll have all external clamps around the outside diameter. They'll clamp it down, and then they'll do the internal bore. Then they'll remove all them clamps into the centre and then turn externally. And they've got to clock the ring up uh, manually. But what we were looking at at the time was magnetic uh, work holding. So effectively a radial pole chuck. So the actual engine ring will sit on top of the radial pole chuck. You can turn X, you can have a, a special device which centralises the part. So you, your clocking and setting is reduced. But you can actually bore internally... Uh, turn the top face, face the top, and uh, turn externally all in one operation. Because obviously, the clamping is from the bottom, and you've got pull down force as well. So you, the, the the again, that is a, a you know, there's so many different ways to. Did you uh, did you get the order? Yeah, we 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 did get the order. Well, for the one oh, on that the, was the one for the one <laughs> on the Megaturn. It was actually at Columbia Precision at, uh, at Birmingham, um, and we used a different uh, method there. Abbott Pie Jaws was the the method we used there, but same kind don't, of don't principle. You excite, Joe, you talk about uh, pies too much. <laughs> Just um, what, what one for both of you? Um, uh, VTL vertical borer. You've got a lot, a lot more flexibility with a vertical lathe. So why on earth would you buy a vertical borer? 
I don't know whether you, well, it, to, it, again, it depends on, when it comes to tooling, yeah, you would go, well, maybe if you just simply had a simple turning operation and that, and that was it and, and it was, it was, you know, a, a simple boring operation and a turning operation and that's it. And you, you weren't thinking of, you weren't, didn't want to future proof the, the factory, um, comes down to simplicity you start wanting to do more complicated parts then you'd obviously opt for a more sophisticated machine would it not be like the the the, the height of the part as well because obviously if you've got a turret you can you can the boring bar can only be a certain length can't it yeah whereas yeah, on a bore point, yeah. you can you, you can put a w axis in you can obviously you've got these there uh, you know it's get um, yeah, good yeah. Point, you yeah. can get in a lot into deeper components what, what about the fact that the ones that we've seen or i've seen a few of is the uh, the machines that are almost like the, the two machines um, in one, so you've got you know two two chucks either inverted or in the normal position, and then two turrets, and they're typically op one and op two machines. Huachon do one. In fact, I've seen one at Desmond Engineering. Great for the automotive industry where you you're you loading one side doing op one, taking it out. You know, there's also automation that you can use between the two of them. And I think this is one of the things we haven't touched on is the fact that your vertical lathes might not be quite so operator friendly but if you if you start introducing the automation to them like some of the things we've been looking at recently the the robo jobs i don't know whether that would would apply but you know uh, robots that you can actually put the parts on and take the parts off actually takes away some of that that disadvantage that we might have suggested earlier did you used to watch your desmond's <laughs> Channel Four. Can you remember it? You know, yeah, Joe, dead man. Can, can you remember it? <laughs> Joe came for the jokes today. No, can you, can you, it's a good program. It wasn't a joke. It, it, it's been one of my favourite programs. No, the no, Desmonds no. from the eighties. <laughs> I can remember. I, it. I was two at the time, obviously. But. Desmond O'Connor. Is O'Connor one of the two? The, there is one thing that I wanted to uh, mention as well. Is about when I, I've been to the Tosulin factory in the Czech Republic and I toured it. And there is a great video on our YouTube channel on it. In fact, it's one of our um, one of our most views vi viewed videos. And I go around the whole of how the machines are built, how they're machined, and they machine the tables for the the vertical lathes on their vertical lathes, and you get to see how it. How the whole uh, setup from a from a, a cast into a finished product, but the interesting point is at the end of the video, they have to disassemble the machines to ship them to bring them over. So you know, like when you're selling a you're buying a vertical machining centre and it comes from wherever it comes from, it's made, it's checked, it's boxed, it's shipped, and then it's empty, it's um it's delivered to your site. Not with some of these vertical lays because they're so big, so they have to take them all apart. And then put them all back together again on site. So there's a there's a cost associated oh, with that. Massive. And potentially, I wouldn't say there's problems, but it means that you have got to take a machine that might have been fully tested apart and then redo those things again on site. That's massive cost. Uh, with, with, yeah, you, know, you're, you have to build the machine twice. Again, I don't want to keep going back to this story, but this installation on the BOST, how heavy do you think the Y-axis was? The Y-axis, how heavy? Um, the Y-axis, how heavy? <sighs> Two tonne? Five ton, sixty-five ton. What? <laughs> really? Sixty-five. Sixty-five ton. How much wow. did the whole machine weigh? I was about a thousand ton. Wow. Really? Yeah. Grief. Yeah, it's a big, wow. big old machine. Yeah, eight, eight point five meter swing. That beat you on a seesaw. Wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. It, it, I don't suppose it was a thousand ton. I know it was heavy. You can take a hundred ton on the table. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. Incredible. So to summarise then, guys, vertic vertical turning um, and vertical boring is definitely an option, isn't it, in, in some of the applications we've spoken about, automotive industry, energy parts. Big valve bodies. Big, big valve bodies, rings. Um, and it does, it does offer you the ability to maybe take heavier cuts uh, with the machine in a smaller footprint. Definitely. Yeah, I think yeah. you've nailed it. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Okay, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks Cheers for joining Paul. us, guys. Enjoy Cheers the weekend. Jen. Enjoy the sun. And yeah, what are you getting up to, Joe? I didn't get to ask you at the start. Probably... DIY. Are you some it's... more jokes? No, 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 no <laughs> jokes. Probably DIY. But well, you say you're going camping. You're going to get, camping, your, get yeah. your tent from the same place as your jackets. <laughs> <laughs> Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we'll leave it on that. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you on the next podcast. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye.